little while ago. People may remember we played just a little bit because this was all that was available uh, publicly at that point from a debate that I did last year at the uh, Festival in Hay in Wales with, among other people, uh, Thangnam uh, Debonair, who's a Labour Party MP, uh, who's um, actually, I will say in this discussion, she comes off okay, right? You know, you can, you can tell that, um, you know, she sort of comes off moderately social democratic. I think she's actually probably a lot worse than you get a sense of here. I mean, she was very anti-Corbyn, et cetera, but, uh, within the Labour Party. But uh, in any case, they have released a, uh, a much longer uh, chunk of that. So uh, we are going to play that before we go to Cedric. I would like to be paid 500 times more than you so I can have my own spaceship. Nope. <laughs> uh, and I'm also not going to do very much except sign off on final decisions. That's probably going to be a hard no. We're going to start by talking about whether social hierarchy is in itself unavoidable. And Ben, you're the one who, in the panel, who's come closest to a sort of whether it's democratic socialist or Marxist view of society in which we're much more equal than we are now. But even in communist regimes, there's a huge amount of social hierarchy, isn't there? You know, party members get better flats than non-party members. Yeah, well, I don't actually think that's a great model. I and mean, if, uh, if the question is, if the question about whether we can have a better kind of society than we have right now is can we recreate East Germany, I would vote no, let's not do that, right? Uh, but I, happily, I don't think the choices are East Germany or the sort of uh, late capitalist hellscape that we have right now. You know, I think there are other options and I think there are real life precedents for other options. You know, we can look at things that have been successfully beta tested under capitalism, uh, national ownership of certain industries. I would point out healthcare in this country, you know, which has been wildly successful uh, in many ways, um, you know, so much so that even conservative politicians have to pretend to not want to get rid of it entirely uh, or else they would never win another election. I would point to uh, successful uh, worker cooperatives like Mondragon Federation in Spain. So I think there are real life precedents that show that other things are possible. You know, if you put the, if you put these elements together in a different way. Now, can you get rid of hierarchy entirely? I think it depends what you mean. Right? So if hierarchy means there are functionally certain people who have the ability to make certain decisions, then no. I think any, you know, I mean, anybody who's ever been to the kind of meeting where people are supposed to do, you know, jazz hands instead of clapping and, you know, come to consensus and everything probably has wanted to kill themselves after a few minutes of that. <laughs> I don't advocate that as a model for anything, you know. Uh, I think you do need a certain amount of operational hierarchy in practice that certain people are empowered to do things and, you know, make decisions, but I think it needs to be paired with democratic accountability. I think that's the, uh, I think that's the key point that they... Do you mean democratic accountability within the organization or politically at, at, at a national level? Yeah, uh, both. I think, that, I think that within organizations, I think democratic accountability is good. I think if you, you know, I think if you look at decisions, for example, made during COVID about, um, you know, when people had to go to work and what ways and all of that stuff, you know, you can see some really bad effects of um, the people who these decisions most affect not having very much say in them. Uh, and, you know, and look, again, if hierarchy just means that anybody has more of anything than anybody else, sure, right? I think that they, you know, even in a worker cooperative, you don't have completely, where everybody gets to vote on wage scales, you don't have completely flat wage scales, you know, that you have some people being paid more than others, for all sorts of reasons, you know, here's something you want me to do that involves a lot of stress and responsibility, you know, I, I'd like more money if I'm going to do that. Here's something that I'd like to do, you know, that you're asking me to do that's really dirty and dangerous, right? I'd like more to do that. Both of those are totally legitimate, but you're just not going to have, given that democratic accountability, you're just not going to have the level of inequality that you have within the kind of economy that we have right now. If I, If you go to your fellow workers and say, I would like to be paid 500 times more than you so I can have my own spaceship. Uh, <laughs> and I'm also not going to do very much except sign off on final decisions. That's probably going to be a hard no. Okay. So you're happy with some hierarchy, but just a flatter one, basically. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Namon, I'm playing devil's advocate here, by the way. Um, uh, Namon, 
you're talking about how university educated people are sort of unduly rewarded. On the other hand, if you want to persuade people to spend three, four, for some professions, seven years of their lives in academic training for that profession, surely they ought to be more rewarded for it afterwards because they're not earning money during that time, whereas people kept picking up the knowledge on the job or at least being paid while they're getting the knowledge. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we shouldn't be rewarding uh, university study by any means, because I think there are, um, you know, there's, there's lots of skill and, and, and you need to go to study certain for certain jobs you you're we not want our brain to... surgeons trained don't we well <laughs> i mean you do, but i i guess we're looking at um at, at what um the rewards that aren't there for those people who haven't taken that path and perhaps um making it more yeah equitable where we can um and and i don't think that um our current system where uh, knowledge gained in that way is um, is rewarded higher is is going to you know um, take us into the next century or be able to kind of um, provide us with a, a kind of framework by which we should be looking at how we can make a e more equitable society because I think um, it, it's it, it just doesn't work for everybody. Does any society work for everybody? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I'm going to chuck in um, another line of thought, which is a group of people for whom none of this works are people who are undocumented or illegal and who have crossed the border possibly with extremely good reason in fact in my experience as an MP with the highest immigration caseload in the country I would say mostly with extremely good reason and usually with legal cause but are pushed out of a system such that those jobs which people have now walked away from in the documented legal market will be filled eventually probably by illegal, undocumented, low security, low pay, poor conditions. So they will not be able to say to an employer, you want me to do this dirty, dangerous work, I want more money. They'll probably just be going, I'm grateful for the work and be exploited. They will be doing right now. If you if you ask yourselves, where are all the baggage handlers at airports? You can tell this has struck a chord with me this week. Um, <laughs> Did you well, try to <laughs> fly somewhere this week? <laughs> tried and failed, tried and failed. Um, you oh. can see that actually they, because it's also on the Eurostar, by the way, um, yeah. you can see that there are, are, are these are places in the labour market where there will remain gaps if in order to take up employment in an airport or the Eurostar terminal, you do have to be security checked. But in those other jobs, such as being an Uber driver or um, one of the cycling delivery companies or the grocery delivery companies, there will be an attraction, a pull factor for those who are undocumented if nobody else wants to do those jobs. And they don't have the same sort of power to demand better working conditions. Um, those that so that that illegality framework also needs to be placed on top of also the gender framework which Namone rightly put there which is that the jobs that we have traditionally undervalued that are sometimes it turns out they are skilled but we just didn't think of those as skills traditionally have been dominated by women and that has continued what we can now add on to that not just gender but also race and migration status that creates an underclass of people who are very vulnerable to being very exploited and will have little say in whether or not they ever get a decent job or decent pay and actually sectors that become feminized yes. it's not just ones that started feminized but but industries yes. and sectors that become feminized see relative pay rates fall yes which i think is really interesting Yes, they do. I mean, a, a, an extreme example from a, another country is that of um, prostitution or the paid sexual exploitation of women. And in the Netherlands, when that was legalised around the turn of the century, um, the argument was made, this is a form of work like any other. When it is legalised, it will be regularised. Those women will then form unions. They will demand better paying conditions. From whom, I wonder? And, <laughs> and in fact, what happened was women's choices, the Dutch women's choices were opening up anyway in other careers. So over the course of the last two decades, that so-called job like any other has come to be dominated by undocumented, illegal or otherwise vulnerable women, marginalised women, trafficked women in particular, and um, for whom the legal structure, all it's done is legalise their, um, their exploitation, which is, yeah, I'm going to add another layer on top there. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> don't don't apologise. Um, but coming back to the sort of baggage handler problem, we might use a sort of shorthand and, and the great resignation. 
isn't the market just going to sort this out? Aren't we just going to have to? And it's already starting so to happen far. in care homes, isn't it? You know, there's such a shortage of carers, thanks to Brexit, thanks to COVID, that they're actually going to have to be paid more. Hmm? Well, but are they? I mean, at the moment, I haven't seen any move from central government, and I do watch them rather closely, who are saying, yes, we will now give more money to local authorities when they purchase care from a care home. I've not seen that happening. All I've seen is local authorities continue to be underfunded. So although um, there are moves to say, yes, we should have better paying care homes, where's the money coming from is a question that's not yet been answered. Mm. Okay, so we've been talking about the underpaid. Let's talk about the... I'm using air quotes, overpaid. Are they overpaid? Um, are we overpaying professional and management roles? Given the amount of um, work that people have put into getting to those positions in the first place and the responsibility they then have to carry. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the job, but I would also point out, you know, even with the example ex as extreme as, as brain surgeons, and I think it is worth keeping in mind that the vast majority of people with upper middle class jobs are not brain surgeons, uh, don't have that level of contribution to society. Uh, but even with a job as extreme as that, I mean, since, you know, paying one person more means paying somebody else less, you know, there, there is actually, you know, there are finite resources to, uh, to go around. Um, then the question is, well, is not necessarily is it illegitimate for even the brain surgeon to, you know, to get a little bit more if that's what you need to incentivize people to be brain surgeons? It's, is this level of inequality actually justified by, uh, by the need for those incentives? And I'd also point out that, you know, part of the setup, you know, when you're talking about brain surgeons even, you know, it's about how well they're not making money during all of these years. Okay, well, that's a fixable problem, right? There have been societies and can be societies where people are paid you know, to uh, to attend school, especially if they're attending school to become brain surgeons. You know, they uh, we can uh, we can give them salaries during that time. I uh, I also think it's at least an open question whether um, in a society where more, everybody had their basic material needs met in a much more adequate way, how much just the value of social prestige would be enough to get people to want to do these jobs. And I think there is some evidence for that. You know, we like there are a range of societies historically and right now, where some of these pay gaps are bigger or smaller than others. And it seems like people still want to do the more high prestige jobs where oftentimes they're doing more interesting tasks, have more control over what they're doing, all things that tend to appeal to human beings. I mean, like, I don't have specific statistics on brain surgeons, but, you know, the, uh, the society in the world with the high, with the best doctor to patient ratio is Cuba. And, you know, and I'm, I'm fairly sure that's not because, you know, Cuban doctors are paid more extravagantly than they are anywhere else. In more socialist societies, or more egalitarian societies, I should say, perhaps like Scandinavian countries, is it that there are narrower pay differentials or is it just that taxes are higher? Because taxes are definitely much higher, which enables them to pay for, you know, uh, higher benefits and better childcare and all the things that you would want. Well, I think it's some of each uh, that, you know, I mean, certainly a large tax funded welfare state is a good thing and, you know, and, uh, and I'm all in favor of it. But also, I don't think that you would get those in the Scandinavian countries without incredibly powerful labor unions that have, you know, again, without which you just would not have achieved that kind of welfare state that have, at, you know, to a certain extent, right? I don't want to exaggerate. I don't want to romanticize societies that, you know, are um, not as fundamentally different as we may sometimes talk about them as being, but, you know, to a certain extent have equalized uh, wage levels in certain things. Like, you know, they'll engage in sectoral bargaining, right? So the, Union Federation is bargaining for wages across, you know, across an entire sector of the economy, which is the sort of thing that at least to an extent and at least within certain areas uh, does equalize wage levels. So I would argue the two go together. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron-exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron-exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess.
I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>